Hi, my name is Mike Roylance. I'm the principal tuba with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I started playing the tuba when I joined band in sixth grade middle school in Orlando, Florida. Um, I came to play the tuba because my band director uh, asked me, his name is John Gorecki, who never forgets your band director. He asked me to buzz my lips and I did and he said I would be a fantastic tuba player. But I don't know if that was true. I, I do know that nobody else had chosen the tuba at that point, so I'm not sure why things ended up the way they did, but, but I play the tuba, and I have been doing that ever since. Um, I've been with the Boston Symphony Orchestra now for 18 years, and I, uh, you'll see me sitting in the, usually in the back of the orchestra, alongside the trombone section and alongside the string bass section. I'm sort of the glue between the brass section and the string section, as well as the woodwind section, uh, harmonically and pitch-wise. Uh, it's, it's sort of my responsibility to tie in rhythmically and, and harmonically, pitch-wise, uh, to the rest of the orchestra to bring the brass section in. There, there are four members of each family of instruments in the orchestra, the brass having the trumpets, French horn, trombone, and tuba, so there's there's where you'll find me in that brass family. So I, I'm the tuba player. That's me. That's what I do. So I want to tell you a little bit about the tuba, the, the background of the tuba and the parts that make up the tuba, the components of it. The tuba was invented around 1835, uh, patented in 1835, and became a, a part of the standard orchestra that we know today. It is actually the most modern instrument in the orchestra, meaning it was the last instrument added to the modern orchestra. If you were to, to unwrap this tuba, which is 16 feet long, it would be, it would probably go from here, oh, all the way back to the hall. And it, it's just basically the same note as the, the uh, lowest note on an organ. And it sound, sounds kind of like this. So without any valves pushed in, that's the note it produces. And how do we make these sounds on a brass instrument? So this instrument shares all the same parts that every other brass instrument shares. So the most important part of every brass instrument is the mouthpiece. And how we make music based on this mouthpiece seems kind of strange because it's just a piece of metal. It looks like a funnel and you blow air through it like that, but that doesn't make any music. So you have to create pitch by vibrating our lips together like this. And then you put that mouthpiece over that and it, 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 uh, it will amplify that. And then, just like a singer, you decide if you want to play higher or lower. And so when you put this on the in, in the instrument, it sounds like this. So this part here, don't do this at home, but it's called the bell. Uh, because it's shaped like a bell. If you turn it upside down, it would be shaped like a bell. Um, as you blow air through this part of the mouth of the horn, this is called the lead pipe. So basically the mouthpiece goes into the lead pipe. You, you buzz and blow air and it goes through the lead pipe and it goes through here. And you see these buttons here. I don't know if you can get a good look at these buttons here, but there's one, two, three, four here. And then on this tube, I have one here that's a thumb trigger. So I actually have five things to push down. And so if I don't push anything down, like I showed before, it'll go right past these. It'll bypass them and then start wrapping around the horn and spin up and then it'll vibrate and, and this will help amplify the sound. This is much, much like a guitar electric guitar goes through an amplifier. That's what the rest of this horn does. It amplifies the sound that I put in through the mouthpiece. So there are valves. Now, as I mentioned before, these, I'm, this horn has a, has a combination of what's called piston valves. They, they go up and down and inside here, you'll see this. So this is the inside of the valve. And there's these little holes there. I don't know if you can see it. It kind of looks like Swiss cheese. And depending on if I push the, the valve up or down, it'll redirect the air in a different, different direction through the horn. So it'll, it'll make the pipe longer or shorter depending on which notes I want. So I have four of these. And then I have this type of valve here, which I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's a round circle there and it's called a rotary valve, like you'd see on a French horn or some trombones. Um, 
And we also have slides, and, and you might have seen me pushing and pulling some slides, or you might, <laughs> actually when you see me play, you'll see me adjusting these slides right here. And I reach back from behind the horn and I, I pull the slide up a little bit further or in a, a little bit further if, if I want to change the pitch. So much like a trombone player will have a slide or a, a violinist will have a, a, a string and if they go higher, the pitch goes higher or lower. Same thing happens here. So for instance, and it'll help me play in tune better. So I've got a slide here, I've got a slide here, slide here, slide here, slide here, slide here, slide here. I've got all these slides. Some of them I use a lot, some of them I don't. The most important slide that you'll find on your horn is the main tuning slide. And sometimes they're really, really stiff and hard to get out, but you should, let's talk a little bit about maintenance. I know it's everybody's favorite talk, but this is the main tuning slide. So it's not attached to any particular valve. It just changes the length of the tuba itself. And if I'm playing in an ensemble and I'm trying to be in tune, I have to make sure that this is in the right position to play that note in tune. When I was talking about maintenance, you need to add um, valve, gr or sorry, slide grease onto the sides. So I wish I had a thing of slide grease here, but you basically just apply it with your fingers and rub it around and then put it in here. Not a lot, but just a little bit, and then put it back in here so that it can kind of move out in and out, but not fall in and out. And the same thing applies for all of these slides. There's a little bit of grease on there. Um, the valves themselves require a thing called valve oil. And there's all different types of valve oil you can get. Um, but these are for piston valves. And this is probably the easiest thing to do, but also a, a very uh, could, could be very bad if you were to drop the valve. So I'm going to take this valve out again. Okay, just unscrew it. And then take the cap off this, this valve oil. I'm going to pull it out. And then I'm just going to squeeze a little bit of oil as I'm turning the valve. You never want to take the valve totally out of the casing. Just take it out about right there so that you don't risk dropping it. Because if you drop the valve, the tube is not going to work, period. Then your band director and your parents are not going to be happy. So put it back in, um, screw it back down, Let's see if I can do that. And then you have a happy valve. It's important to oil your valves, I would say, once a day. You don't need to do more than that, and just a tiny bit. You don't need to, to, to pour oil on it, just a couple of drops, and then do the same for each valve. Um, these are things that you can do at home. There are some things that, if it happens to your tuba, that I would only ever take the, tu the tuba, the instrument, to your band director or to an instrument repairman. Don't ever try to do things to fix it yourself. If you see any part of these slides like breaking off or, or pulling off, or if you, like I said, drop a valve, don't try to fix these things yourself. Go to a band director, go to your instrument repairman, have them fix the problem themselves. Um, one other interesting thing about tubas and all brass instruments is there's a, um, it used to be called a water key, it's called a condensation key. Some people call it a spit valve. Um, so when you're playing your tuba, you empty it <laughs> every time condensation fills up in the horn. Um, but be very careful. Um, it, this is something that can really easily be broken if, it, if it's pulled on or tugged on the wrong way. So anyway, that's, that should be easy to move in and out. All of these slides, should be, you should be able to push and pull all of them easily. Some of them move faster than others, uh, depending on which ones I use more often. But they should never be f uh, what they call frozen. And if you don't oil or grease a valve or oil, or, or oil a, a, sorry, grease a slide or oil a valve, eventually they're gonna become stuck and you'll never be able to move them again. Let's talk about practicing. Um, I practice a lot. <laughs> I, I, it's really important that I practice because that's my job and I come to work and they expect me to play everything perfectly, absolutely perfectly. So I have to practice. Um, and 
how I go about practicing is probably not much different than how you should go about practicing. You should divide your practice session as a beginner into some very basic exercises where you're learning how to produce the right pitch and the right tone and, and learning the right fingerings for different notes. And then the, another part of your practicing should be learning the music that you're working on in your band. So for example, um, I start every day by buzzing on my mouthpiece, um, just by itself. So I'll find a note. So play the low note on your, on your tuba, pick out the mouthpiece, and just buzz that note. Okay, and try to buzz a melody. So let's say you probably all know this melody. I hope you recognize that. And then it, you, it doesn't matter which tune you play. It could be something you hear on the radio, something you hear on, on, on your, the latest TikTok or, or whatever you're watching or whatever, wherever you hear your music, learn or hear, hear that melody and just buzz it on the mouthpiece. That's the first thing I do every day when I start practicing. Next thing I do is I put it on my tuba. And I think it's really important to start the day uh, this way, no, ma no matter if you're a beginner, media, intermediate, or advanced player, start with a very, very soft playing. And so the lowest note on your tuba is probably a B flat, because most beginner tubas are B flat. And so what I want you to do is, is start that note. This is the first note you play a day, and play it as soft as you can. So I'm going to play, well, I'll, I'll play a B flat this time. So don't pay attention to my buttons, because my buttons are different than yours. But I'm going to play a B flat. And if you're a beginner, I just want you to hold the note out as long as, you, as long as one breath will hold the note out. It should be about four to maybe eight seconds, depending on how much air you can hold in your lungs. So take a bigger breath the next time and try to hold the note out for longer. And again, play soft. If you play loud, you're going to use more air, so you're not going to be able to play as long. So play soft. So take a big breath. Just play till you run out of air. And you're gonna play about four, maybe five of those notes. And then you're gonna to start to, to do this exercise that sort of goes away from B flat going downward. You're gonna take a breath and continue. Take a breath, and then you're gonna come back up. Whenever you run out of air, just take a breath. So I was using the, the right same fingers that you'll use, so you can use the same fingers that I just used on that. And I went from B flat, I went B flat, A, B flat, A flat, B flat, G, and, and I went all the way down to low E. I can't sing down there, so I won't sing it, but I, I went all the way down to low E, and then I came back up, and I'm trying to play soft. I'm not playing, trying to turn to play super loud, but I, I think it's really, really important for you to want to sound uh, great. So. You're, you're, if, if there's a thing that you're trying to achieve, every time you practice, it should be sounding great. And, but that means a lot of different things for a lot of people. So a, a couple of things, I want you to do a couple of checks on your sound. If you're playing a sound that sounds like this, you're probably not using enough, enough air. So this is that sound again. And how I'm doing that is I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm kind of, keeping my lips together to, to really keep the air tight, don't do that, okay? Let the air flow normally and have a nice, round, uh, vibrant sound. Okay, and then there's one other sound, which is the opposite of that, where you're using too much air. 
where the air, you're hearing a lot of the air in the sound. So you kind of want to go in between both of those to try to get the most uh, natural sound that you can, you can achieve on your, on your horn. Um, I think the most important thing in that regard is that you're actually listening to what's coming out of your horn. So that's a really important thing. For you guys, beginners, I, I would concentrate on trying to achieve a 15 minute practice time every day. And then as you get better, you're probably gonna wanna start practicing more music and, and that time will start to build. But if you can practice every day, every day, like Monday and then Tuesday and then Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, for about two weeks, you'll start to notice an incredible amount of, of progress. Whereas if you practice Monday and then take Tuesday off and then come back Wednesday and then take Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off and then come back Monday, you're probably gonna take about three months to get where you could if you were to just practice every day for two weeks. So anyway, have fun. Practicing is great. Enjoy it. Uh, I want to talk to you a bit about my favorite part of my job, and that's playing with other people. And, you know, the amazing thing is when you put all these things together and you practice and you're, you're listening and making yourself better, and then you go play with your friends, um, they notice that you play better and they want to get better, and hopefully they're getting better and making you feel the same way, and, and then the more fun the whole thing becomes. I mean, that, that's the whole purpose that we all start out in music is because it's fun and it's keep it fun. Um, to keep it fun, show up prepared. And what does that really mean? We used to have this thing in my band called Pencil Check, and everybody had to immediately stop what they're doing and grab their pencil that was on their stand and pick it up. So that's means, so guess what? You need to have a pencil with you. Maybe your school program uses iPads and you have one of those Apple pencils, great. But have a pencil or a writing device that you can use to write on your music. Do not use a pen, use a pencil because you need to be able to erase the marks, and most importantly, your band director needs to be able to erase the marks. If the band director says something about the music, or your conductor in, in your orchestra, or, or your, your wind ensemble says, you know, play this note this way, don't just shake your head and say yes. Write it in, write in whatever the person asks. If they said, can you play that note softer? Can you play that note louder? Can you not play that note? You know, or can you play this note here? Write in a little part so that the next time that comes, you'll remember how to do that. Um, you know, if the best thing I can tell you about listening in an ensemble rehearsal is if you only hear yourself, you're probably playing too loud. So make sure that when you play, you can hear the other people around you um, and make sure that you can hear how your sound fits in with them. You know, start to listen to, to tuning. And if you notice that your pitch is not with the person next to you, who should adjust first? You, <laughs> um, period. You know, nobody wins a prize for being the last one to change their pitch because they think they're right. Everybody, everybody in music, if you wanna be a part of a band or an orchestra, you need to be able to adjust your pitch right on the spot all the time. You know, the music that you're gonna play in your band or your orchestra, you, you need to know. You, you don't rely on the, on the rehearsal in the band or the orchestra or your lesson don't rely on that as a way to learn the music. You know, if, if you're practicing these 15 minutes a day, you, you should be pretty familiar with this music so that when you get into the rehearsal situation with your band director or your conductor or your orchestra conductor, they can work on things to make the music sound better as a whole, not just worry about individual players. One thing that I taught was taught really early on was that on time is late. So, just learn that right off the bat. You wanna be in your seat, uh, ready to go, minimum five minutes before the rehearsal is gonna start, period. And if it's a lesson, same thing. You don't wanna be uh, there right on time. You wanna be there earlier so that you can be relaxed. And this is also gonna help your brain so you're not scrambling to get everything ready at the last minute. Um, you know, something in, in today's age, I think that's very helpful is make sure that you're recording your lessons. Um, Ask your teacher first if, 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 they're, if it's okay for you to record your lesson. But I think it's really, really important to remember as much as you can from each lesson. So don't be shy about asking if it's okay to record. Absolutely. I mean, it, 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 if you're recording your lesson and then listening to it and practicing what, you, what you've worked on during your lesson, your progress will just skyrocket. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. 